Okay. Uh, well, thank you for having me. And I guess the first question is, what time is it now? We're a little bit of a tight schedule. So I want to just know, what time is it now? 6.14. Quarter to seven. Quarter, uh, quarter quarter to seven. seven. So if I speak for about an hour, it'll be right. Correct? Okay. Um, I know there was an assigned topic for this evening. And if you'll forgive me, I'm going to adjust the topic. Uh, because there are some events uh, which are now uh, moving towards, it's possible, a historic, uh, a historic climax to the Israel-Palestine conflict. And there doesn't seem to be altogether that much awareness of what's going on. Um, and so I'd like to not so much sound the alarm bell, though alarm bells need to be sounded, I think, as just to try to clarify the picture right now. Because things at one level, sort of the level of elite politics, are moving forward now at a pretty rapid pace. Uh, and I don't think the solidarity movement or people at the popular level, they're really taking into account that uh, serious things are happening. Uh, as some of you know, the Secretary of State of the United States, John Kerry, uh, towards uh, the end of July of this year, he embarked on this initiative, this mission, however you want to call it, uh, to solve the Israel-Palestine conflict. And there's been a tendency among people, because there have been so many undertakings, so many endeavors, uh, to resolve the conflict, to dismiss this latest carry initiative as more of the same, and something that can be safely ignored. Uh, but I think that's a very mistaken approach. I could be wrong, of course. Nobody is infallible, and uh, politics is a very tricky game. But if you were to ask me to put, so to speak, my money on it, uh, I would say there's a more than 50% uh, likelihood, a more than 50% chance that Kerry is going to succeed where his where those who have preceded him have failed, and there is going to be a historic breakthrough in the conflict. Uh, now, under normal conditions, in normal situations, uh, that shouldn't be ground for alarm. Quite the contrary, it should be grounds for uh, happiness that a conflict which is now endured for a century uh, will finally come to an end. There'll be some sort of resolution of the conflict, uh, which will allow people to live in peace and uh, get on, so to speak, with their lives. Uh, but I don't think really that's what's happening. Uh, what's really hap what's happening is that a, um, uh, a conflict is coming to the end, but it's not going to come to an end on the basis of the principles of justice, principles of fairness, uh, as the gentleman who preceded me said it in the, his initial remarks. Uh, it's not going to be based on international law. And it's not going to be based on human rights. Uh, if the conflict comes to, uh, comes to an end in the terms that Secretary of State Kerry uh, is now uh, proposing, the conflict will come to an end uh, on the basis of a historic defeat of the Palestinians. Uh, it's quite clear what Kerry is trying to do uh, as to why he's trying to do, to do it, I'll get to that in a moment. But what uh, Kerry is trying to do, as I said, is pretty straightforward. Uh, namely, he wants to resolve the conflict, uh, but he's going to try to resolve the conflict on Israel's terms. Uh, Israel has made clear what its bottom line is, or what are the minimum conditions so far as it's concerned for resolving the conflict. And those minimum conditions are very straightforward. Uh, if you look at the factual record, the documentary record, Israel will insist on keeping approximately 10% of the West Bank, what's called the major <coughs> settlement blocks, uh, keeping, as they keep those 10% of the West Bank, it will mean keeping the critical water resources, which are a scarce uh, commodity in that part of the world, keeping some of the most arable land, keeping East Jerusalem, 
and what remains of the Palestinian territory uh, will be fragmented right at the, what was the waste of the West Bank from East Jerusalem, excuse me, from Jerusalem to Jericho. Uh, the settlement of Male Adunim will cut it in half, the West Bank. And then the settlements in the, in the north, the settlements of Ariel and Shamran will cut the northern half of the West Bank in half again. Uh, there won't be much left of the West Bank. Uh, it will be stripped of its natural resources. It will be uh, deprived of the potential um, tourist revenues from East Jerusalem. Uh, and it will be fragmented. Uh, it won't be a viable entity in any sense of the word. And so it's quite clear one of the stops that Kerry has been making, he's made several stops in Jordan. Uh, and one of the reasons he's been going to Jordan, I think there are several reasons, uh, but one of the reasons is because eventually they want to confederate what remains of the West Bank with Jordan. And so for all intents and purposes, uh, in effect and in practice, the net result of the Kerry Initiative is going to be to uh, uh, make Palestine disappear from the map. Uh, the basic route of the <coughs> new border they're trying to draw is very straightforward. Uh, as the former foreign minister, I think current justice minister, uh, Sipri Livni has repeatedly said, and I think it's true, the final border is going to be the wall that Israel has been building. Uh, and that's one half is the territorial uh, annexation of critical parts of the West Bank, and the other half of the, of the terms of Israel's bottom line, as everybody in this room knows, is the nullification uh, of the refugee question that will be turned into a some sort of financial settlement internationally, and the Palestinians will be stripped deprived uh, or their rights under international law uh, will be nullified. Those are the basic terms. That's the bottom line. That's Israel's bottom line. Uh, there have been other things thrown in, and if time allows, I'll discuss them, uh, calling Israel a Jew, recognizing, recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, some sort of Israeli military <coughs> presence uh, in the Jordan Valley. Uh, but the very fact that if you follow the news, I don't know how many of you do, but if you follow coverage of the Kerry Initiative, uh, all of the focus has been on the Jordan Valley and recognition of Israel as a Jewish state. And that's very revealing. The reason everything is focused on the Jordan Valley and recognition of Israel as a Jewish state is because everything else that I just went through with you Everything else is a done deal. The Palestinian leap, so-called leadership, knows they've already lost that. And it's not even, there's no point in even talking about it. So all they're talking about are things which they figure, maybe we can win something on it. Don't stop so they can win anything. But maybe we can win something on it. But on the critical issues, uh, namely the borders, um, the refugee question, they already know they lost all of it. Uh, and they're not even pretending as if these are even topics uh, open for any further debate. Uh, so in effect, uh, if you look at, uh, for those of you who know the lingo, the jargon of the Israel-Palestine conflict, they have always talked about the final status issues or the permanent status issues. And they consisted of four. They consisted of borders, Jerusalem, refugees, and settlements. And on all four questions, the borders the Palestinians will lose because Israel will annex a critical 10% of the West Bank, which will fragment whatever is left of the West Bank. They lose on East Jerusalem because the route of the wall already tells you East Jerusalem has been incorporated into Israel, except for about 100,000 Palestinian Jerusalemites who are on the West Bank side of the wall. They lose on settlements because Israel will retain about 80% of the settlers. Um, they estimate between 75 and 80% of the settlers within the new border. And they lose the refugees because the refugee uh, question will be completely annulled. 
uh, nullify it. It's, and Israel will not even accept any historic, moral, or legal responsibility for what happened, let alone practical implementation of the right of return. Um, those, I think, are the terms of the carry initiative. And in fact, they have to be the terms of the carry initiative. I'll get to the details of it in a moment, but I want to just set out the framework. Uh, Kerry fully well knows that you want to resolve the conflict. You can't fight a battle on two fronts. You can't fight a battle both with the Palestinians and with the Israelis, because it's never going to work. Uh, so in order to resolve the conflict, you have to side with one party to the conflict and then pile up on the other side, inflict a defeat, and then it's possible. And so the Kerry strategy is he appropriates, has his own, the Israelis' terms for resolving the conflict, their bottom line, so to speak. And it's basically a fait accompli uh, dictate, uh, uh, dictating to the Palestinians uh, these are the terms for resolving the conflict. Uh, and so I think we're approaching a historic moment, some might say a dire moment, some might say a catastrophic moment. However you want to term it, I think the important thing for our purposes, and I will consider my remarks this evening having achieved a degree of success, if people recognize that something serious is happening. Uh, there, there has been a tendency, especially among the so-called you know, solidarity movement, the international solidarity movement, to simply dismiss, ignore uh, all of these events. Which is frankly, I have to say, it's completely, if you'll forgive me for saying so, it's completely insane. Uh, when you have the most powerful president on Earth, on the planet Earth, and the Secretary of State investing so much time and so much energy in this initiative, when Kerry has been going back and forth more times now to the Middle East than any other uh, Secretary of State in the history of the United States, if, uh, <clears throat> If he's meeting with every party to the conflict, now he's heading off to Saudi Arabia. Uh, he's been, uh, President Obama, as you know, met with um, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu on March 2nd. Uh, he'll be meeting with uh, so-called President uh, Abbas on March 17th. Uh, and in the midst of the Ukrainian crisis, he's not even canceled that meeting and the vote in Crimea on the referendum for secession is supposed to be March 16th, he's still not canceled the meeting. I mean, what do you think? This is a joke? Are they going to set themselves up to be humiliated and walk away with an egg on their face? I mean, they're deadly serious. This is a huge investment of time. And people of that stature, that caliber, that rank, uh, they don't like to be humiliated. Their prestige is on the line, and that's a serious thing for these folks. Uh, they're investing all this time and all this energy is because something serious is happening. And it's really, I uh, have to say, at a personal level, it's a little bit frustrating uh, to see that people, nobody seems to be taken seriously at the popular level. Kerry's taking it very seriously <coughs> at the popular level. Uh, people don't seem to be taken very seriously. Oh, uh, what's up? Uh, uh, an initiative which I think has a pretty good chance of success. It is true to say, and I'm first the first one to admit it, uh, the Kerry Initiative would have been completely unthinkable, impossible to predict a year ago. So it just came out of nowhere. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, once it happened, it kind of makes perfect sense in retrospect. It makes perfect sense in hindsight. When it began, and as I said, in July of this past year, uh, most people, as I said earlier, dismissed it as quixotic, nothing should ever come of it. Uh, I wasn't of that opinion, and I was on Democracy Now! at the time, for those of you who are familiar with that program. And I was asked about it. I said, no, I happen to think this is serious business. Uh, there is a real problem. Uh, brewing here. Uh, and at this point, I think there's a large number of mainstream commentators. I'm not talking about the Palestine Solidarity Union. A lot of mainstream commentators who have come around to the opinion that this is pretty serious stuff uh, that's happening. Uh, and in fact, it makes perfect sense at many levels. So let me just try to go uh, quickly through the record 
uh, so we can put everything in a kind of perspective uh, that may convince people in the audience who are skeptics on the topic that you know, maybe we should wake up and pay attention to what's happening. Uh, maybe the guy, meaning myself, maybe the guy has got a point. Uh, Carey is not the first one to try to resolve, not the first high-ranking American official to try to resolve the conflict. Uh, the first of them, let me just check this. I'm wondering, do you hear me fine in the back? No, you don't. Right? But the fellow behind you does not. I wish you had told me. I, I began to suspect it. Uh, it's not so difficult to make it work better. Uh, how is that now, guys? Okay? I don't want to lose you by virtue of just a small technical. <laughs> you hear me? Just raise your hand the last row to hear me fine. Okay. Um, Kerry is not the first uh, high-ranking American official to try to resolve the conflict. Uh, as most of, you will, uh, most of you will at least have been alive, or more or less, to remember that in 2000, President Bill Clinton, he embarked on his own initiative to try to resolve the conflict. And it climaxed in the uh, meetings in Camp David, in the, the negotiations in Camp David. Uh, Clinton's motive was pretty clear. Uh, uh, Clinton had entered what, in the American terminology, I, I think it is perhaps peculiar to the United States, we have this expression, and the president enters the legacy years. And that basically means it's the end of the president's term of office, usually it refers to two terms of office. And when you come to the end of your term of office, the president begins to worry about how he or she, in our case, thus far it's only been he, uh, how he will look in the eyes of history. What is the legacy that he's going to leave behind? How a history book's going to report him? And Clinton was a very, uh, uh, Clinton, uh, whatever, whatever you think of him personally, whatever you think of him as a politician, the bottom, the factual matter is he's an extremely intelligent man, uh, remarkably so, in fact. And he invested himself a lot in his political uh, life. He likes politics. He likes the give and take of politics. He likes the policy making, uh, public policy. Uh, that's, the, that's the milieu, that's the ambiance uh, that he enjoys being in. And Clinton, by the end of his presidency, uh, of course, it had been tainted by the Monica Lewinsky affair. And he wanted to remove the stain of the Monica Lewinsky affair. And he thought he could do it by resolving the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, and as I said, he invested a huge amount of time and energy into it. He's a very smart guy. And uh, people said, and I think it's probably true, that by the time the Camp David negotiations ended in 2000, uh, uh, they ended technically in December 2000, but they were resumed again a few weeks later in Kabul in 2001. But by the end of his period of uh, in the, uh, uh, negotiations, he had mastered uh, the uh, map of Jerusalem, he knew every street, every alley, every byway. He uh, invested himself uh, a lot in it. Uh, and uh, he didn't achieve success, but the fact of the matter is, if you look at the record, uh, he came uh, pretty close. Uh, the obstacle was, uh, at that time, the uh, president of uh, Palestine, Yasser Arafat, who was uh, unwilling to accept the terms, in my opinion, correctly, un or justly, he was unwilling to accept the terms that Clinton was trying to impose on him. Uh, after the Clinton uh, period ended in, uh, abortively, he didn't succeed in reaching an agreement, the next major attempt was made in 2008 by Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Uh, Condoleezza Rice was facing the same problem as Clinton. She was the Secretary of State. Uh, she was relatively young. She still felt that she still imagined herself to have a promising political career ahead of her. And there was some talk, and it may still materialize, uh, that she would be the Republican candidate for president. Uh, which would be sort of unusual in the United States, would be basically a Condoleezza Rice against Hillary Clinton. Uh, and so she anticipated her political career ahead of her, uh, and uh, she was in the same uh, situation, sort of like Clinton, because she was the Secretary of State under Bush, 
the Bush presidency ended in a completely disastrous note, and in particular, the foreign policy uh, aspect of the uh, Bush presidency was in a shambles because Iraq went so badly from the point of view. Uh, Rice uh, turned to Bush, and she said she wanted to rehabilitate her legacy, and Bush was very close to uh, Condoleezza Rice, some people say intimately close, uh, which need not concern us. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, Bush said, go ahead. You can try to resolve the conflict, see how successful you are. She held negotiations, not this time in Camp David, but the negotiations this time were held in Annapolis. Uh, and the Annapolis negotiations also didn't produce an agreement. Uh, what it did produce, and for those of you who are interested in these sorts of things, what it did pro produce was a very interesting record of actually what happened. Uh, one of the Palestinian negotiators uh, did not like the way his colleagues were negotiating, and so he released all the transcripts, which came to be called the Palestine Papers when they were published by uh, Al Jazeera. Uh, but it didn't produce a record, uh, but you'll notice the pattern. Clinton starts trying to, uh, Clinton is at the end of his presidency, it's 2000, worried about his legacy. Um, Condoleezza writes 2008, it's the end of the Bush years, worried about her legacy. And now, uh, Secretary of State Kerry, uh, he's in the same basic position as the two previous cases which I've cited, namely uh, the foreign policy record of President Obama uh, has not been very impressive from their point of view. Uh, the only thing that Obama can claim for himself is he will go down history as the drone president, uh, which is not very impressive for somebody who uh, claims to be a progressive. Uh, right now, they're, in their, they're entering their legacy years. Obama is very concerned now uh, because Obama is a stupefying narcissist. So legacy is basically the only thing he ever even cared about from the day he entered office. Uh, and so you see all these manifestations of it uh, daily. So three or four days ago, all of a sudden, President Obama says we have to raise the minimum wage to $10.10. And two days ago, he said that we have to uh, give uh, overtime to workers, uh, overtime pay. Uh, and then he was being denounced by Latinos. They were calling him not the commander-in-chief, but the deporter-in-chief, because he had deported more Latinos than any other previous administration. So today he's talking about, in today's news, he's talking about immigration reform. You know, it's just pure cynicism. He's trying to uh, rehabilitate his record because we're entering those legacy years. Uh, and John Kerry himself, uh, he's coming to the end of his own political career, a long one uh, in the US, uh, both in uh, Congress, then he got the president, and now a Secretary of State. Uh, and he wants something to redeem, uh, to vindicate uh, his legacy, and like Bush, excuse me, like Clinton, and then like Condoleezza Rice, he's trying the same thing. Uh, that's oddly enough the purpose that Israel-Palestine has been reduced to now. Uh, it's a legacy rehabilitator. Uh, so uh, the pattern here is quite interesting because uh, in the case of Israel, in the case of the uh, Obama administration, Obama basically told uh, Kerry, "It's your baby. You try it. I'm staying away from it, except if it looks as if you have a good chance of success. If you have a good chance of success, I will step in and I will use all the power of my presidency to push it over the top." Uh, and for us, that has to be a warning sign, because the fact that Obama, who up until now has kept the Israel-Palestine conflict and Kerry's initiative, Obama has kept it basically at arm's length. He's now moving in in a quite prominent way, which is to say he's risking his prestige, his reputation uh, on the success of these talks. 
Uh, and the fact that he's decided to do that must mean, I think, uh, that in his mind we're coming to the end. There's a real chance that uh, Kerry is going to um, pull it off, and so of course he's going to enter not only to push it over the top using all the power that's invested in him uh, to succeed, but also uh, stupefying narcissist that he is. If it succeeds, then he'll take the lion's share of credit for it. Well, the first conclusion uh, to reach is a kind of oddity. Uh, we're talking about a conflict which basically, in its international dimensions, uh, begins about a hundred years ago. It begins with the Balfour Declaration. Up until the Balfour Declaration, it was pretty much a local conflict between some foreign settlers who wanted to come into Palestine and turn it into a Jewish state, and a local population which is resisting it. But with the uh, uh, Balfour Declaration in November 1917, it now becomes the stuff of great power politics. Great Britain has intervened in a very large way. Um, and uh, it's approximately just a few years short now of a century. Uh, and the conflict might be coming to an end. Uh, and the paradox is, people like to think, or want to think, or wish to think, that we're talking about a conflict where big issues are at stake. It's about colonialism, imperialism, capitalism, racism. Um, and the, uh, as I said, the kind of deflating paradox is, if the conflict is resolved, and there is, a, I think, as I said, a better than 50 percent, better than 50, 50 chance it will be, it will only be because of um, personal vanity. There's nothing particularly large at stake. If it gets resolved, it's because a president and his secretary of state, uh, they want to leave behind a, um, a legacy that vindicates them. Uh, some people might be disappointed by that kind of conclusion, leaving aside the kind of settlement they're going to try to impose. Um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, vainglory, personal vanity, when it's harnessed to a very powerful state, which the United States is, vainglory, personal vanity, if it's harnessed to a very powerful state, it can do a lot of damage. It can inflict a lot of uh, human suffering uh, on people. The obvious question, uh, which will no doubt have occurred to some of you, if not all of you, is, why should we take Kerry any more seriously than we did uh, Clinton and Condoleezza Rice? Or put differently, why should we expect that Kerry could succeed where his predecessors, uh, where his precursors have failed? And here I would think that there are several factors uh, which would lead one to believe that Kerry's probability of success is much higher uh, than that of those who came before him. <coughs> the most significant factor is that Palestinians are now in a state of unprecedented, unprecedented isolation. Uh, the uh, Palestine conflict has been a kind of oddity, an anomaly, a kind of aberration in world politics. Because as everybody in this room knows, it's a tiny, tiny place, <coughs> barely perceptible to the naked eye, uh, if you're looking at a map and usually requiring a couple of magnifying glasses in order to find. And yet it's a conflict which has had first major regional resonances, regional repercussions, and then eventually it had um, major international repercussions. It's a conflict where the geopolitical repercussions of it have been much larger than the conflict, the size of the conflict itself. We're talking about a very small place with, relatively speaking, a very few, small number of people. Uh, in the 1930s, when the Palestinians went into revolt against the British mandate uh, and also against what seemed to be the imminent uh, transformation of Palestine into a Jewish state, uh, this what came to be called the Arab Revolt of 1936 to 1939. It had major regional repercussions. It became a, uh, a source of concern, anger, uh, uh, and inspiration for the entire Arab world. 
1948, when the uh, Arab states were defeated in the first war with Israel, uh, the uh, main outcome of that war on the Arab side was the resurgence of what was called back then radical Arab nationalism, and the standard bearer of this radical Arab nationalism was Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, and Nasser, <coughs> more in words than in actions, but still in words, he embraced the cause of Palestine, so Palestine had a big resonance during this period of Arab, uh, resurgent Arab nationalism. 1967, the neighboring Arab states faced a major defeat again at the hands of Israel, and after the 67 war, the Palestine struggle emerges as the one hopeful sign in the Arab world, and now at this point it spreads, uh, the Palestine struggle spreads in its influence, its impact, its resonance, its repercussions, it becomes an international symbol. And that international symbol, it was um, uh, climaxed in 1974 when the head of the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, Yasser Arafat, uh, received the hero's welcome at the United Nations. Uh, and then again in 1987, uh, the Palestinians, this time in the occupied Palestinian territories, they entered into a revolt uh, against the Israeli occupation. It was called the Intifada. And the Intifada, again, was a source of great inspiration, a mass nonviolent civil revolt against the occupation. It became a major um, inspiration uh, to the Arab world, and also, again, had a huge international resonance. But the fact of the matter is, right now, I can't predict for tomorrow, I can't predict for next week, uh, but right now, the Palestine struggle has been reduced in its resonance, reduced in its significance. It's now more or less been reduced to a uh, provincial secession movement. Uh, it doesn't have the resonance it once did. Partly it's because Palestinians themselves, after uh, decades of struggling and resisting, uh, have grown uh, cynical of politics, despairing of politics, and by and large, with honorable, courageous, uh, noble acts of isolating resistance, by and large, Palestinians themselves have stopped resisting. Uh, and the other reason is because uh, other crises have now displaced the Palestine struggle on the international agenda. Uh, everybody in this room will, of course, be familiar with them. First, starting with Iraq, then Libya, and then, of course, now Syria, and then also as a, a sideshow, but still a, a significant factor, uh, namely Egypt. Uh, and so, next to these other crises, um, the Palestine struggle has been dramatically reduced in its political resonance, its political salience. Um, how many how many people, let's say three people are killed by Israel one day, three people are killed by Israel the next day, but as compared to about 150,000 people who have been killed in Syria and several million refugees in Syria, uh, the Palestine struggle appears uh, by comparison to these small potatoes. Uh, I just came back the past uh, couple of months. I spent uh, some time in Turkey, and then I spent a, a couple of weeks in Iran. And it was very note noteworthy for me that uh, wherever I went in the Middle East, the Arab Muslim world, uh, nobody showed any interest whatsoever in uh, Palestine, even though that's the area which I am most competent to speak on and uh, to give a, an opinion on. In Turkey, the main concern was restoring the caliphate. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with the drinking water there, but there is a serious <laughs> problem. Uh, and their main focus of concern it was not the United States, it was not Israel. Uh, in Turkey, the main focus of concern was Iran. They wanted to figure out how to stop Iran. Uh, and then, a couple of weeks later, I went to their nemesis, which was Iran. Um, and Iran, obviously, the item first on the agenda 
And really the only item on the agenda was uh, whether or not negotiations with the current President Rouhani and the United States will succeed in getting the sanctions lifted. Um, because, uh, because the Palestine struggle no longer has much resonance in the Arab world among the people, very little interest in it, uh, if any interest actually, at the level of governments, of states, uh, Palestine is now also uh, uh, lacking in support. Iran, as I said, uh, they're not going to get any support from Iran because Iran is not going to jeopardize these negotiations uh, with the United States in order to go to bat for Palestine. That's just not going to happen. Uh, Rouhani was elected to get the sanctions lifted, and if it means turning a blind eye in Palestine, uh, there's no doubt in my mind, whatever the rhetoric might be, there's no doubt in my mind uh, that he's going to turn that blind eye. He may not endorse it, but he's not going to resist it. Um, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, uh, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states have now basically entered into an overt alliance with Israel uh, in order to contain the influence of Iran, or their imagined view to contain the influence of Iran. Turkey, which championed the Palestine cause uh, for a short period under the current Prime Minister Erdogan uh, during the Israeli massacre in Gaza in uh, 2008-9, and then a couple of years later during the Israeli assault on the humanitarian vessel in Mavi Marmara when Israel killed nine uh, humanitarian activists. Uh, right now, Turkey is facing, or Erdogan, the Prime Minister, is facing his own setbacks. He bet on the wrong course in Syria uh, and suffering on account of that. And also, he's also facing a lot of domestic uh, turmoil. And so, uh, there's no likelihood, in my opinion, that Turkey will do anything uh, for the Palestinians. And so, the bottom line is, uh, that's at this particular moment, and you have to bear in mind, or I, I would suggest you bear in mind, that politics is about moments. It's about striking at the right moment when the iron is hot. If you take advantage of that moment, you can push through something. If you miss the moment, then you miss a historical opportunity. And at this particular moment, uh, Palestine stands alone. And Kerry is perfectly aware of that. He seems to have, though I don't know who they are, he seems to have very excellent advisors. And they tell them if there's any time, if there's any opportunity to uh, end the conflict on American terms, uh, that opportunity is now because both at the popular level and at the level of states, uh, Palestine has no support right now. Uh, it's extremely weak. And then you have to complement that fact complete that fact um, by the internal, uh, the internal picture among the Palestinians, and it's a very desolate one right now. Uh, there's always been, or at least since 1991, there has been a physical separation between Gaza and the West Bank, but that physical separation has now turned into a psychological chasm between the two. So, for example, during the Israeli massacre in 2008-9, uh, there were very few protests in the West Bank uh, when Israel was carrying on its massacre in Gaza. The people of Gaza are now being relentlessly squeezed, first of all by Israel, second of all by Egypt, third of all by the Palestinian Authority, and of course behind all of them, the United States. Uh, the purpose of squeezing them is very straightforward. Uh, they want to make life as unbearable as possible for the people of Gaza so that they, the people of Gaza rid themselves of Hamas. Uh, there's no secret about that. They've made it very clear. They want to democratically uh, get Hamas removed by the people of Gaza. And it seems like they're on the verge of success in their uh, venture. Uh, right now, the Gaza economy is under 
verge of uh, total bankruptcy. The Hamas government is unable to pay salaries. Um, and I read just this morning, the uh, title of the article was, Hamas in worst cash crisis since seizing of Gaza. It says, as I said, the government can pay salaries. And the result is completely predictable. Uh, Hamas has done its own internal polls. And Hamas's own internal polls say that if there were elections in Gaza now, they would get less than 30% of the vote, well, which was uh, exactly as was intended. Uh, the Palestinians in the West Bank, uh, the collective will to resist has more or less vanished and replaced by the attitude of every man for himself. Or as the Palestinian put it to me a couple of days ago, he says Palestinians are now thinking in the economic short term. They're no longer thinking in the political long term. Depressed, despairing, and despondent, uh, they have on the whole given up on and become cynical of uh, politics. The Palestinian Authority, even aside the people right now, the Palestinian Authority is no secret to anyone in this room is hopelessly corrupt and incompetent. It survives for three reasons. Number one, mass apathy. Number two, because in the West Bank, 25% of the population depends on salaries issued by the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and number three, uh, they put in place uh, the CIA torturers and the Jordanian torturers. They have put in place a very effective uh, repressive apparatus. Uh, the Palestinian Authority, the police force, is no longer a rinky-dink operation. It's quite serious and quite effective. How effective it would be if there were a mass uprising, it's impossible to tell. But in terms of repressing isolated pockets of resistance, uh, it's been very effective. Uh, and the Palestinian Authority itself, uh, it's completely dependent on the U.S. and the EU, the European Union, for financial handouts. Uh, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, they're always producing like two or three times a year, literally. They produce these very sophisticated reports on the quote-unquote state of the Palestinian economy. And it has lots of graphs and lots of data. It seems very impressive. And they'll have charts comparing the Palestinian economy as compared to the economy of other developing countries like Brazil and Taiwan. Um, the whole thing is completely preposterous. It's a pure mystification um, because there is no Palestinian economy. It doesn't exist. And a moment's reflection is perfectly obvious that it couldn't possibly exist. Israel controls half the land in the West Bank. It controls all the critical resources, in particular the water. Israel controls all the imports. Israel controls all the exports. Uh, and the little territorial base that remains is just a rat's maze of um, uh, blockades. You can't um, uh, move goods. You can't move services around the West Bank. So anybody with an ounce of common sense, a moment's reflection, would understand there is no economy in the West Bank. Uh, and that has very important political repercussions because it means if you're totally dependent on Western European American handouts and you're completely dependent on them, then at any single moment they can just take a scissor and cut the thread. And then what are you going to do? Uh, the Palestinian economy now hangs, hangs by the Palestinian society. It hangs by the slenderest of threads. And the, since Kerry launched his initiative, the um, Western countries, including the US, the EU as well, uh, they've been threatening uh, every day, really. They've been saying the same thing. If you don't go along with the Kerry initiative, we're cutting the money. Uh, the EU, the, e the European Union, in, um, in theory, they've never been that bad. Uh, they've always said they supported international law in theory. Uh, the problem is, as a practical matter, they've never done anything to implement international law when it comes to Israel-Palestine because they're afraid of the United States and they don't want to rile the United States over the issue of Israel and Palestine. 
Uh, but the EU position has now changed because, you know, the, for the EU, this whole conflict, for the European countries, this whole conflict, conflict is completely insane. It's been going on for a hundred years, and it, it involves uh, a, a geographic space and a, de a, a uh, demographic, you know, the size of this room, more or less. And so the whole thing is sort of crazy. Uh, and on top of that, on top of that, the EU has been footing all the bills of the occupation. If you go into the West Bank and all these NGOs, as they call them, in um, Ramallah uh, and everywhere else, all the projects, they're, fought, they're funded by one or another European government, the Danish government here project, a German government project here, it's all been financed today by the EU. And the EU has grown weary of, uh, of paying the bills. And now the EU suddenly sees there's actually an opportunity to end the conflict. Uh, there is light at the end of the diplomatic tunnel, or as the EU foreign minister, uh, not foreign minister, but um, foreign policy chief, Catherine Ashton, she said last week, she said, uh, the Kerry Initiative is the only game in town. And that being the only game in town, the EU has laid down the law. For those of you who follow these things, uh, the EU has repeatedly said to the Palestinians, you don't negotiate the Kerry Initiative, we're pulling the plug. And they said to the Israelis, because there are some crazy Israelis who don't even realize they got everything they wanted, uh, and so they're giving Kerry a hard time. And the EU has said to the Israelis, if you don't negotiate the Kerry Initiative, we're going to impose stiff sanctions uh, on your settlements in the West Bank. And also the EU has said, and it keeps saying it almost every day, it said to the Palestinians and it says to the Israelis, if you agree to the Kerry Initiative, if you go along with it, it's going to be an economic windfall for you. So just yesterday, I think, an EU representative said to Israel, go along with the Kerry Initiative, and we're going to upgrade your status to almost that of a full member of the EU. And to the Palestinians, they say, we'll give you lots of money if you um, go along with it. Uh, so now, uh, uh, we talked about how the Palestinians have been isolating the Arab world, and now this, the flip side of that is they're under a huge amount of pressure from the European countries for the first time ever uh, to negotiate the conflict ended on Kerry's <coughs> terms. And you see, you know, your own Prime Minister David Cameron, he was in, his, uh, he was in the Knesset yesterday, uh, and he said, I support the Kerry Initiative, a Angela Merkel of Germany, you got to end this conflict, has to be the Kerry Initiative. They're all piling up now. Uh, and uh, the question is, uh, can the Palestinian Authority resist the pressure that's now being exerted on it? Uh, I think the reasonable, uh, the reasonable conclusion that we can predict with certainty uh, is that it can't resist. Uh, the Palestinian Authority has very few cards to play. Uh, all of Palestinian diplomacy, what they call diplomacy, the whole of their diplomacy uh, consists basically of two things. Uh, Prime, uh, President uh, Mahmoud Abbas played good cop to Saab Eretet, uh, uh, his bad cop, and the both of them threatening to resign every few months. Uh, Saab Arakat actually threatens to resign about every five minutes, and I doubt he even knows right now whether he is or he isn't the chief diplomat. Uh, the, the bottom line is, after a thou the thousandth performance, this sort of shtick, this sort of routine, begins to wear thin. Uh, if the Palestinians uh, capitulate, and I think there's a high probability at the leadership level that they are going to capitulate, the pressure on uh, Abbas this Monday, this coming Monday, is going to be just, uh, it'll be breathtaking. I don't like the guy, I don't sympathize with the guy, and I do think it's time that he go to his maker, uh, but I would, not, uh, I would not envy his going into the room uh, on Monday with uh, Obama, 
uh, because Obama, after, as I said, what happened in uh, Syria and then the Ukraine, he's not going to take a no from Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, Abbas's arm is going to twist, be twisted until it falls out of the socket. It's going to be. It's going to actually end as it began. The process that we're now beholding is the consummation, the completion of the process that began in Oslo in 1993. Uh, now, many people, I think, have forgotten, and for those of you who are younger, uh, you're forgiven. Certainly, you're forgiven for not remembering Oslo. <coughs> Uh, you know who Justin Bieber is. <laughs> um, what happened in 1993 was uh, the chair, the then so-called, uh, no, he was at that time the chairman of the PLO, uh, Yasser Arafat. He had bet on the wrong course in the, folk, in the first Gulf War. He had supported Saddam Hussein. Uh, turned into a complete disaster, and after Saddam Hussein was defeated, uh, the Gulf states did two things. First of all, they carried out a mass expulsion of the Palestinians who had been working in the Gulf states. And the second thing the Gulf states did was they cut off all the subsidies, uh, the financial subsidies to the PLO, and they basically kept the PLO going because the PLO was just a patronage machine. Arafat would hand out money to this faction, hand, hand out money to that faction, uh, and, and that's how it survived. And Arafat saw that his days were numbered because now he had no more money in his patronage machine, the PLO. Uh, and so just at the moment, it looked like it was, as the expression had it back then, the expression was, it was bye-bye PLO. Just at that moment, the U.S. and Israel were smart, they're shrewd, they're clever. They decided to throw Arafat a lifeline they said to him, we'll keep you alive, we'll finance your machine, but only on one condition. And the condition is you become our enforcer in the occupied territories. Uh, Arafat was desperate. He accepted the deal. That's called the Oslo Accord. Uh, he thought he was very, very clever. He had a very high opinion of himself. I don't think the facts warranted it. Uh, but he had a very high opinion of himself. And he figured, I'll sign the deal. I'll get back into Palestine, and then I'll figure out a way to get out of it. I'll finagle myself out, because I'm so clever, I'm so smart. Well, of course, that's not how it turned out. Uh, rather than him finagling himself out of it, uh, Israel and the United States, uh, quite effectively, they managed to turn the PLO into exactly what they wanted. It became a very sophisticated instrument of repression, uh, doing the uh, Israel and the U.S.'s dirty work in the occupied territories. And now we're seeing the, the climax of that process, because just as it was Arafat's financial crisis that forced him into the Oslo Agreement, it's the fear of an economic meltdown again that's driving the current Palestinian Authority uh, to uh, make a deal with the US and EU who are threatening to pull the plug. What is the Palestinian position in all of this, the so-called Palestinian Authority? Its position is very easy to understand. Take every, step, every statement that Mahmoud Abbas says, makes every statement that Saab Arakat makes, and in Wayne's world fashion, just put a knot at the end. And that's, the, uh, that's their position. So if, um, what's his name? If Mahmoud Abbas says, uh, we will never give up Jerusalem, not, you're giving up Jerusalem. <laughs> we will never give up the right of return. Not, we're giving up the right of return. We will never accept the legality of the settlements. Not, we're accepting the legality of the settlements. Um, that's their position. Every word out of their mouths, for anybody who reads the record, every word out of Saab Arakat's mouth uh, is a lie. Uh, and it's a kind of, it's, a, it's, a, it's so cynical, it's so revolting to watch I was, the other day, I watched his interview with Nafti Hassan at Oxford. Any of you see it? Raise your hand, I'm just curious if you saw it. So the thrust of his interview is, he says, we have to hope and pray that Kerry succeeds. It's just unbelievable. We have to hope and pray that Kerry succeeds. And he says, I've known Kerry for 26 years, and I know he's an honest broker. 
this is really painful uh, to watch. The guy is such a such a flaming imbecile. <laughs> really. And he talks about how he's done all the sacrifices he's made for Palestine. What sacrifices? If he weren't the chief diplomat, he'd be a bouncer at some Jericho uh, a casino. <laughs> Meanwhile, I guess he can walk around claiming he's an important diplomat. He's a nitwit. He's not a diplomat. All the important people he knows have known Terry for 26 years. The whole thing is its a kind of a revolting spectacle. Uh, and the um, Mehdi Hassan is pretty good, I have to say. Uh, but then they start taking questions from the audience, and a Palestinian woman raises her hand. Uh, and she says, uh, Mr. Howard, I have a personal question to ask you, so I'm bracing myself. What is this going to be? And she says, um, I want to know, how do you separate your personal feelings from your job as a negotiator? And I say, what the hell is this? Oh, problem. <laughs> what are you talking about? And then he turns to her and he says, oh, you look just like my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and I met to this up and said, you sir. Yeah, you know, it's really kind of, you can laugh, and I, I can't laugh. I mean, I'm going to bust the gut. But uh, you think, this is a century-long construction. So much blood spilled. So many people's lives lost. So many people imprisoned. So many acts of heroism. I mean, People who were on hunger strikes for 60 and 70 days, and to think it's all going to end this way, it's really, it's kind of sad. It's, it's all sort of really kind of pitiful. This flaming imbecile, Eric Kett, chief negotiator, they have never negotiated anything from the beginning to the end. Because what's to negotiate? You have no power. You're going into a room. You're not negotiating. They're just telling you, this is what you have to do. You're not negotiating. What are you negotiating? Right now, Abbas is going to be meeting with uh, Obama. Abbas, he's an imbecile. I mean, no question about it. Frighteningly so. I mean, this is a guy who... Had the, how many people know that Abbas is a doctor? He has a DR, he has a title, he's a doctor. How many people know that? Raise your hand. Okay, you know how he got his doctorate. Now keep in mind we're talking, the peak, his intellectual peak, when his mind was most nimble. He got his doctorate, how to get his doctorate? He doesn't want anyone to know he's a doctor. Whereas Eriket, you know, you're not allowed to talk, you have to call him Dr. Eriket. You know? <laughs> Eriket needs a doctor, but that's another story. <laughs> but with, uh, with a boss, with a boss, he doesn't want anyone to know he's a doctor. And you know why he doesn't want anyone to know? Because he's afraid people are going to ask the question, what'd you get your doctorate in? He got his doctorate, he wrote a thesis denying the Holocaust. Well, that's not a very impressive doctorate. Uh, and it certainly won't go off too big in Israel. So let's drop the doctorate business. Uh, and so he's going to be uh, meeting with Obama. He's not negotiating anything because even though he is an imbecile, he's perfectly aware because they've been doing it for 20 years. He's not going to get anything. What Obama, what he wants, what he's begging from Obama is, give me some face-saving gesture so I can sell this to the Palestinians. You've got to give me something. I know you're not going to give me anything substantial. That's over. We're, it's not even a topic of discussion. We're not talking about settlements anymore. We're not talking about Jews anymore. We're not talking about borders anymore. We're not talking about refugees anymore. But give me something. Uh, and it's pretty obvious, actually, it's perfectly obvious what they're going to give him. Uh, because they've done it a hundred times, not a hundred times before, but they've done it before. So to give you some idea what the U.S. has in mind, uh, this past Sunday there was an article, it was titled, I'll give you the title, Prague, meaning Prague, the Czech Republic, Prague Conference showcases enormous potential of Palestinian economy. Prague Conference showcases enormous potential of Palestinian economy. 
Now, by the way, this is just ridiculous. My backyard has more economic potential than the uh, West Bank. And I live in an apartment building. I don't have a backyard. But it still has more economic potential than the West Bank. So the article says over 100 people attended a major conference in Prague this weekend to discuss an economic initiative designed to bring about transformative change in the Palestinian economy and brace yourself and create hundreds of thousands of new jobs. Hundreds of thousands of new jobs. The initiative for the Palestinian economy is under the leadership of who's leading this whole thing? That intergalactic freak, that grinning Count Dracula, it's being led by Tony Blair. <laughs> uh, and Blair said, speaking at Saturday's opening event, Tony Blair said that the potential of the Palestinian economy is enormous. And then, to make sure that everybody gets into the act, they bring in Madeleine Albright. Some of you may remember her as the former Secretary of State. And before that, she was the US's representative at the UN. Her colleagues used to call her Madeleine Not-So-Bright. Uh, Madeleine Albright told the participants, she said, and this is quite interesting, it was a piece of news to me. She said, to give you all an idea of why we're here, less than a year ago, we had a meeting with Secretary Kerry about our work. So they were already coordinating this idea a year ago. And then the kicker, the key line, for those of you who are careful readers, it comes towards the end. It says, Blair explained that the initiative is a complementary, meaning completing, is a complementary process to the political negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, led by U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, and is not a substitute. So what does that mean in layperson's English? What, what Blair is saying is, if you want the hundreds of thousands of jobs, you have to sign on to Kerry. It's not a substitute. You can't get the jobs unless you sign on to carry. And that's what they're going to dangle in front of the Palestinians. As most of you know, especially Palestinian youth, so in the West Bank, I think it's about 50%, in Gaza, even higher, around 50 more percent of uh, Palestinian young people, roughly the ages of the people in this room, uh, they're unemployed and they're going to dangle in front of them uh, the prospect. If you, give up the, if you give up the politics, they're going to give you, you know, the jobs. And the fact of the matter is that we don't mystify Palestinians, that we don't imagine them being superhuman beings, but being like everybody in this room, uh, capable like everyone, most everyone is, of great acts of courage, but also people who are concerned about survival, living, getting on with life, getting married, getting a home, having children, uh, and facing the prospect of being unemployed, uh, there is a good possibility because number one, as everyone in this room knows, hope springs eternal. Uh, number two, people forget. Uh, number three, uh, well before we get to number three, when I say people forget, uh, people forget, how many people here have a memory of 1993, the Oslo Agreement? Raise your hand. Okay. If you go back to the Oslo Agreement, and I was actually doing this this morning, uh, and in your free time, if it interests you, just go to a Google search and put down Oslo, New Singapore, Gaza. Oslo, New Singapore, Gaza. Why do I mention it? Because in 1993, they played the same game. They were, be, they were saying that if you sign on to the Oslo Accord, 1993, we're going to turn Gaza into the new Singapore. And there was all talk about turning, you know, as they called it here, a transformation of the economy. Well, we're 20 years later, 
God says not the new Singapore. Uh, God says more or less uh, the old black hole of Calcutta. Uh, that's what Oz that's what Gaza got from uh, the uh, Oslo Accord, and I would say with 99% certainty, that's what the Palestinians will get from the hundreds of thousands of new jobs. And uh, but people are, as I say, they're forgetful. They forgot what was said in 1993. And secondly, and I can understand it, I'm perfectly uh, sympathetic to it, uh, hope springs uh, eternal, uh, and they're going to hope maybe this time, what the hell, who knows, maybe I'll get a job out of this. And I mean, you're unemployed long enough, <laughs> that's a very tempting prospect. Uh, so, uh, the, the only, the one wild card, the one question mark, is of course the Palestinian people, uh, because uh, the U.S. and uh, everybody recognizes that there has to be some sort of popular ratification of the agreement. Otherwise, it's not going to have the look of legitimacy. And so they have to carry on some kind of referendum, uh, uh, probably only include the people of the West Bank. I think it will, personally, I think it will include the people of Gaza, because the people of Gaza have already been broken. Um, and so it's quite possible they're offered these massive amounts of money. They may go for it right now. Um, uh, but the wild card remains the people of, God, of Palestine, uh, what they're going to do when that moment of truth comes, the referendum. Because I think a referendum probably will have to come. And as I said, I don't think Abbas can get away with it. Uh, and he's also promised a referendum. Of course, his promises are worthless. But I think that he's put in a position now that he's going to have to get popular ratification. And so then the big question is what they're going to do. Um, and that brings us, I know I only have two minutes left, uh, that brings us to us. What can we do? And my opinion is that uh, our position is, as it's always been, it can only be a solidarity movement. You're in solidarity with the people who are struggling, solidarity with the people who are resisting. If they don't resist, you can't be more pious than the Pope. It's just not credible. If the Palestinians decide to accept the agreement, there's really virtually nothing you can do here. If they resist, we can be in a position to support those who resist. Um, at this point, the most important thing is, I think, to patiently explain what's happening. Because I think there's a lot, a lot of lack of clarity about what's happening, and our main job now is we have to explain. Uh, I can only say two things. Um, I know it's ending on a kind of down note, but you can't always be a bearer of good news. Uh, you have to sometimes, in 1993, when everybody was celebrating Oslo, there were a few naysayers, a few, a few people who said this Oslo thing is out for lunch, don't go for it. Uh, the most prominent of the naysayers at that time, for those of you who remember back then, the most prominent was Edward Said, uh, who wrote a famous article at the time of Oslo. It was called Oslo Dash of Palestinian Versailles, question mark. He said, folks, are you kidding? We just lost. Don't fool yourself. And all the other Palestinian so-called intellectuals, all of them are bought off. Uh, they're all celebrating. He was the one person who said no. He was the most prominent Palestinian in, in internationally and, and added a lot of moral authority and dignity to the cause and they wanted to drag him to come to the famous White House lawn for the handshake that came to be between uh, Rabin and um, Arafat. And he said, no, I'm not going to have anything to do with this. This is a, a defeat, and we should be clear-headed about the defeat. Well, I think 20 years later, it's quite clear Arafat was right, and all the other uh, people who were celebrating in that White House lawn, the lawn of 3,000, including many Palestinians, uh, that they, um, uh, Let's put it generously, they were mistaken. You can put these other words, but we'll say they were mistaken. And sometimes, you know, you can't be a bearer of good news. You have to be, uh, you know, you have to say what it is. We have to be clear-headed about what's happening. We can't be fooling ourselves about what's happening. Uh, so uh, the, the things that I would say concern me most is, and I'll throw it out to all of you, the first thing is it's a very tough sell now, our side. Because it's so easy to predict what's going to happen. Netanyahu is going to come before the, you know, the <laughs> international arena uh, uh, stage, and he's going to say, "We're giving up 
90% of Judea and Samaria. 90% of Judea and Samaria. And most people are going to go for it. You're going to say these Palestinians, they're rejecting the deal just because of 10%? It's, it, it will have, it will be very effective. Uh, and we have to be clear. How do you answer it? Because politics is about trying to reach a broad public, trying to convince them of the justice of the cause, trying to convince them of the rightness of the cause. How do you explain to people that, no, this is unjust, it's unfair? It's going to be very tough. <coughs> and we have to sort of put our heads together and figure out how do you present to a broad public that when Israel, the United States, the EU, Merkel, Cameron, all of them are going to be pile up in, piling up the Palestinians, and they're going to be saying, we're just talking about 10%. And incidentally, they won't say 10%, because Israel uses a different map. And according to the Israeli map, it's only 6%. Uh, it's, there'll be a lot of tricks, a lot of subterfuge, a lot of press to digitation, you know, with the hands and hand movement. It's going to be a very tough sell. And the fact of the matter is, even if the Palestinians go into open revolt now, let's say there's another intifada, like the first intifada, it's still going to be very tough to get command of the international stage. Because they will, the Palestinians will still be competing with Syria. They're still going to be competing with other humanitarian tragedies. It'll be a very tough sell. Uh, that's being honest. That's, that's what I feel my job is. And you can, of course, disagree with me and say my whole analysis is wrong. Or you can say, well, you know, the guy has a point, and now we have to figure out what to do now. Uh, but I think that's where I'm going to leave it. Uh, I think we're at a, a critical juncture. Uh, and the most important thing is uh, to pay attention to what's happening. And then we can all decide together or separately uh, what we should do, how we should proceed. Thank you.